Hey there, and welcome to Truth Be Told, a theology and apologetics podcast not claiming to have all of the answers, but created to analytically look at the truth contained in the Bible and encourage critical thinking on how to apply that truth to our lives. I'm Micah Gunn, and I appreciate you listening in. No matter your level of understanding or knowledge, I sincerely hope and pray that you find these words edifying, informative, and beneficial. So let's get started. The past month for me has been really, really difficult, and increasingly so, it seems like. Um, And I'm not the only one. It seems like everyone I talk to is going through something or struggling with things that they don't normally struggle with. And I'm not sure if that's just time and chance and everyone's personal life has just things going on right at this moment that seem to be hard for them, or maybe it's the state of the world and the nature of the news that we watch every day and it just gets depressing and things seem like they're getting worse and worse. I'm not sure exactly the cause, but it just seems like everybody is tired and exhausted and really trying hard to struggle through some bad stuff in life. Uh, My dad got sick, went to the hospital, my car broke down, ended up costing me a ton of money. Work just started back up again, and it's not been quite as smooth a transition back as I hoped that it would be. But in spite of all of this, I kind of felt like I was handling it pretty well. I was being patient, I wasn't complaining, and I was even trying to do things like look forward to things that were good so that the bad stuff that happened didn't seem you know, quite as devastating, quite as bad. I still had good stuff to look forward to. And particularly something I was looking forward to was an interview that I had scheduled for this podcast, and it was going to be the first interview of the year. It was something I was really, really looking forward to uh, with a gentleman that I really respect and admire, and it was it was just something that took me a long time to schedule and plan for and work out, and then sure enough, even though it was the thing I was looking forward to, even though it was the thing where it was like, okay, everything else can go wrong, but as long as this is going right, then everything's fine. The day of the interview came and it fell through and I was devastated. Man, I was just so disappointed in this moment. It was like, God, why is everything falling apart? Even the one thing I had to like look forward to and not uh, complain about, the thing to kind of keep me strong in all of the stuff going on around me, then you're going to let that fall through too. Why is this happening? Admittedly, I had this moment of kind of self-absorption and uh, a little bit of self-pity as well, and I, I thought of Job. It was a little bit dramatic, but I compared myself to Job for a second. You know, God, in, in the book of Job, he says to Satan, you can go this far, but no further. And suddenly, I was asking God for myself, how much further? How much more are you going to let happen before something just finally works out? Something gives. There's been about a thousand shoes drop. And I don't know that I can take one more. So how much further does he get to go before you put a stop to this? And yeah, it, w- it was dramatic. It was it was a little bit much, but that that's where my mind went. And, you know, it was, it was just frustrating. I know I'm supposed to bear with my trials patiently, and I'm not supposed to grumble about them. I'm supposed to meet them head on and bear them well. But it felt like now that I had done that, it felt like God thought I could handle more, so he kept allowing things to be piled on. It was kind of a catch-22 in my mind. You know, if I complain and I throw a fit and I don't bear with my difficulties patiently, then I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be trusting God to get me through things and not let too much hit me that I'm overcome. However, if I don't complain, then it feels like God's just going to keep handing me stuff to deal with. It's weighing me down. And I was just getting tired and I got really, really frustrated. And to be honest, it kind of just kept on going because even though, yeah, you can get through that bad thing that happened and the next bad thing that happens and you can keep on going through bad things and get through them all. But now all of a sudden, I didn't just have a problem with my circumstances in life. I had a problem with my mindset where I thought, okay, what am I supposed to do? You know, I I felt like I was living in a contradiction that Christianity called me to or that God called me to where I'm not supposed to complain. I'm supposed to bear my trials patiently, but I'm also supposed to go to God and rely on him to get me through difficult times. And it didn't feel like he was doing this. So how do I reconcile these things? And I, I think the Christian life is full of certain dualities like this, certain practical ideas on how we're supposed to live that seem to juxtapose each other. And if not practical ideas, then at least certain truths about the reality we live in as Christians, as we're fully human, striving to be fully one with God. And there's a lot of these dualities. Some of them include things like our carnal nature versus our spiritual nature, 
or the fact that we're okay with mortality, but desire stronger than anyone, or at least should desire stronger than anyone, the desire to live forever. We're supposed to have sound reasoning, but we're not supposed to abandon emotion. We're supposed to be ready to cast off this life, but simultaneously, life is a precious gift from God that we don't waste. So that just things like this, or um, most commonly people will say the phrase, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And that's true. That's a duality that we live with. Or sometimes a duality I personally struggle with is the fact that we're supposed to live fully in the present, but we're supposed to focus solely on the future or the life to come. And that's, man, to me, that is just really, really difficult because sometimes, you know, depending on the day, my life here is so real. And then other days, it's not as real. And the next life seems so much more real to me. And I kind of go back and forth and I'm trying to balance this out in my life. And this seems to be true of, of Christianity. It seems to be a way of life dedicated to just struggling through, trying to figure out what foot we're supposed to place in front of the next without just tripping over ourselves. And I think this is difficult as human beings, especially human beings like me, who are often considering the the absolutes, the black and the white, the right and the wrong. And we, and on top of that, we know our hearts can be deceptive. We know uh, mankind's always trying to determine right and wrong for ourselves. So how do we even know if our motives are right in all of this, let alone our actions? And man, it's just, to me, this is difficult, but this is also the Christian life that we're called to live. And I think we'll see some of this struggle with people in Jesus' time as well. He spends a lot of time answering these questions that are from people who are thinking in the absolutes, kind of like we do. And his answers are always unorthodox. They always catch people by surprise and uh, offer them something to think about rather than just the twofold option that they thought was there. For example, they might ask themselves, do I help them get the speck out of their eye or do I get the plank out of my own? And Jesus answers them, yes. That's that's your answer. Yes, both of those things. When to us it seems like, well, it, it's one or the other. I can't do both all the time. Or do I love my sinning neighbor or do I despise sin? And Jesus again answers, yes. Or do I pay taxes to Caesar or give to God what is his? And Jesus answers again, Yes. And this can be frustrating when we don't understand what's expected of us, or maybe we feel like we do understand what's expected of us, but it's not going how it should, or we're not sure how to accomplish both of the things we're supposed to do all at the exact same time. Personally, I'm someone who can be obsessed with absolutes, either or, give me one or the other, and I don't really even like gray areas, to be honest with you. I think this is something that everyone can understand, no matter how it manifests itself. Um, maybe for you, it's just something like time management, where it's like, okay, prayer, Bible study, fasting, and meditation. How am I supposed to do all of these things consistently? So instead of doing all four of them, we allow one or two to drift away and we focus heavily on the other two. This is something that I do all the time. It's like we're supposed to be upstanding citizens in this world and that takes time and effort and energy, but we also have to be upstanding citizens in the next world and that takes time and effort and energy and this is hard. This is the Christian life. This is what we're called to. As a mortal human being, living in a corrupt world, striving for eternal life in a place that I've never been, that's supposed to be more home to me than anywhere else I've ever lived, which is the kingdom of God, struggling every day to be a better person, failing a lot, trying to get rid of the carnal side of me, but living with both God's spirit and my spirit in me, I sometimes struggle to know if I'm supposed to embrace the side of me that's human so that I can function in the world or embrace the side of me that is of God so I can function better in the next world that I'll be a part of. And I'm not talking here about living by the flesh or by the spirit or doing right and wrong. Living right according to God is the only way, whether I'm a human being or a spirit being. I'm talking here about embracing the fact that I am currently human or embracing the fact that I hope to be a spirit being someday. Which one do I lean into more? How do I accomplish both if I'm supposed to accomplish both? And you know, as I was writing this message, I thought to myself, maybe this isn't something people struggle with. Maybe this is just me. 
and it's something I need to kind of kind of deal with. But then I was scrolling through social media just like a couple days after this idea came to me, and I saw this thing posted on Instagram by who I presume to be a theologian, uh, Dr. Michael J. Sveigel, and it says Christians need to stop trying to restore a golden age of the past that never really was, and instead start living in light of the golden age of the future that certainly will be. Now, for the most part, I agree with this quote. There is a future coming that I believe in 100%. I'm certain of that future. I know it's coming and I should live accordingly. But it also kind of falls short in some ways in that it doesn't answer certain questions about the meaning of this life or what we're supposed to be doing right now. Or even if the things we're doing now matter beyond being born and then dying so that we have a chance at the next at least. But then you have people like N.T. Wright on the other side. Uh, I'm just reading his book currently, Surprised by Hope. Fantastic book. But in that, he says things like, The point of the resurrection is that the present bodily life is not valueless just because it will die. What you do with your body in the present matters because God has a great future in store for it. What you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself will last into God's future. So then he puts a huge emphasis on today and the work we're doing now. And he says that carries on into the future. But there's something about that that is hard to wrap my mind around. How is sowing something that will last into the future or that has meaning or importance? Not to say you can't do good works with sowing and that that's not something we're called to do, but should we really be spending so much time sowing when we need to be praying or fasting, meditating, Bible study, um, you know, maybe we should be doing more aggressive good works than just, you know, this little thing here or there to your neighbor. But you also have Jesus saying what you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me and that he appreciates that. So to me, it's just this, this balance in life, in the Christian life that is sometimes hard to come to terms with. And I think this is worth talking about. For the very reason that we are called to be something that we are not currently. And how do we live that way? How do we live as we are supposed to be transforming into something new, but we're not that yet? What do we get rid of and what do we keep? And once again, I'm not talking about living by the flesh or living by the spirit. That is that is not coming into the discussion today. But I, I need an answer. You know, I I need to know. What are we supposed to be doing as we're supposed to be fully human, but becoming fully like God? How do we do this? How do we reconcile this? In Revelation 21, verse 4, it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So it talks about these four former things. Not that there aren't other former things, but it lists four specifically here. So maybe maybe this is our answer. The former things, in that future that we're looking forward to, the former things have passed away. And that's good. So should we live in a way that seeks to get rid of that? Or do we go the exact opposite way, accepting that we're human, accepting that we're subject to these things and not do anything about it? And these are kind of the two options. These are the things I'm wavering between. And these are the things we're going to look at today. These four things that are the the current former things, as I like to call them, because at one point in time, we know we're promised that they will be the former things but they are the current things for us right now. So how do we deal with these? And I think it's always good practice to look to Jesus as he is the best example to look at for anything we struggle with. But this particular issue, I think he's, he's really, really a great example. Sometimes I think when it, you know, it says he was tempted in all ways as we are, I think, you know, my human mind thinks, yeah, I understand that, but that's kind of generic. You know, Jesus wasn't tempted with too much cell phone use or becoming addicted to video games or, you know, things specific to the modern era. Now, I know he was tempted in all ways as we are, and I know that the Bible doesn't lie and that that's absolutely true. But sometimes, like I said, my human mind has trouble internalizing this concept. But with this subject specifically, Christ is absolutely perfect because he dealt with all of this. He is the perfect person to look to for the right way to live because while we are fully human, hoping to become fully one with God and really struggling in the process, Jesus was fully human and fully God at the exact same time and did it flawlessly. 
So that's what we're going to be doing today, taking a look at Christ's example as he dealt with these current former things that are supposed to pass away, as it says in Revelation 21 verse 4, and we're going to see what we should be doing now, see how we should be responding to these things today. Do we embrace them as humans or do we treat them as if they've already passed away because our reality is supposed to be so far beyond this life? So we're going to be going through all four of these things death, sorrow, crying, and pain, and seeing how Christ dealt with these things, because he absolutely did while he was here on earth, living out his life as fully man and fully God to see what we should be doing as we become more and more like him, following in his footsteps. So let's just start with the first one then, dying. What should a Christian attitude be towards dying? And and for that matter, what should be our attitude towards living? Because they kind of go hand in hand, even though they're opposites. Do we fear death and avoid it at all costs? How far do we go towards preserving our own human life? Is it of the ultimate value or is it worthless and something we should throw away? These are the kinds of questions we might ask ourselves within this conversation. Now, Christ wasn't really in the habit of talking about himself that often, but I think in other people's accounts of him or what the gospel writers wrote pertaining to how other people considered Christ, we can really learn a lot about this subject. In Luke chapter 7, verse 33, for example, Christ is talking to this crowd of people, and these people have rejected him in a way, and Christ kind of comes back at them, and he says, what would you have me do? I mean, I don't understand what I was supposed to do. That would have been the perfect way for you to accept my message. In Luke 7, 33, like I said, it says, for John the Baptist came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by all her children. So this is what people thought of Christ at the time, that he's a glutton and that he overindulges in wine. Now we know that's not true. But I think what we can take out of this is that Christ enjoyed his life and preserved it. You know, he had food, he had water, he had wine, he had shelter in some cases, and he even had friends. Even if those friends were tax collectors and sinners, who wasn't going to be a sinner that Christ would befriend on earth? But I think all of these things speak to a preservation of life and an enhancement of the quality of Christ's life. He he sought to enjoy his life. He didn't want to just be miserable all the time. And I think sometimes we can almost get this perception of Jesus like he was somber and sorrowful all the time. Now, I think in right proportion, he was, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But he was also enjoyable to be around. He was also pleasant. He probably was also uh, funny. You know, he was God. God is the greatest at all things, including humor. So, you know, I, I wouldn't put it past Christ to tell jokes or We know he was just enjoyable to be around. He went to parties and weddings and he rejoiced. And I think he did all of that in appropriate measure. So I'm I'm getting a little off topic here, but basically what I'm saying is that Christ preserved his life and he enjoyed his human experience in a lot of regards. Now, the one thing he probably didn't enjoy about his human experience was the thought of death. And we can see this in Matthew chapter 26. If you want to turn there, if you're following along, otherwise I'll be reading it. Now, this is the section just prior to Christ's betrayal and subsequent crucifixion. And so he's about to pray in the garden and he has death and his own life on his mind. And this is kind of an insight into how he was feeling about these things. In verse 36, it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we can see that his death was not something that he was looking forward to. The torture, the pain, he was not enjoying the thought of this happening to him. He also, though, didn't try and make death not a part of reality. Christ died. That's one of the key points that we know about him is that he died. He didn't look forward to it, but he knew it was something he had to go through as it's appointed for all men to die once. And so he accepted the will of God, not seeking to prolong his life indefinitely or even extend his life at the expense of everything else, he went through the process. So what can we draw from this? I'd say what we can draw about Christ dealing with this current former thing that he was going through is that as a man, 
Christ enjoyed life. He preserved it. He didn't look forward to death. But as God, he knew when it was time that there was something better coming that allowed him to cross that threshold boldly. And he really did do it boldly. He handled it certainly better than I would have and probably better than anybody would have, to be totally honest. But he knew that he had to die. He saw a vision so clearly of what was coming that he knew death had to come to him, he saw the reason for it, and he looked forward to what was to come. That is how we should also handle death and handle life. We can enjoy life, we can seek to preserve life, and we should seek to preserve life. That's a huge part of the Christian life, is that life itself is valuable, it has value. So not only do we preserve our own lives, but we try and preserve the lives of others as well. That's important to us. But it can't be the ultimate important thing. It can't be the thing that we try and preserve above everything else. And even Christ speaks to this. Uh, He doesn't only exemplify it in his attitude towards life and death, but he speaks to it in, well, several different places. But uh, in Matthew 16, 25, I'll just read from there. It says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. So we know that we have a greater purpose. We know we have something greater to look forward to, and that is unity with God the Father and Jesus Christ into eternity in their kingdom. So that's kind of the perfect reconciliation that we find here in Christ's example as he grapples with these ideas of life and death. So even though at some point death will pass away, it'll be the last enemy to pass away, he also recognizes that we deal with death right now and can't just pretend it doesn't exist. So that is how we deal with this current former thing. Now what about the next one, sorrow? Should a Christian sorrow in the world? And this one to me is really, really difficult because sometimes, particularly considering the current state of the world, I struggle with knowing how I'm supposed to act or even think. Do I interact as someone who is in the world or do I interact as someone who's supposed to be beyond this world? Do I get involved in what's happening or do I stay out of it realizing that it's all going to be over soon anyways? Like I said earlier, my life sometimes in the hereafter is so real to me that sometimes this life kind of fades a little bit and I can become a little bit desensitized to things. And then other times my life here is so real and I'm affected by anything difficult and I forget about the hope that should be an anchor to me. So so what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to interact in this world? Do I sorrow over it or do I just not really care? Do I not let any of it affect me at all? In John chapter 3, verse 16, a verse that most people are pretty familiar with, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should have eternal life. So we see that God loved the world. He cared about the world. And I think we see Christ's love of the world, not just in his dying for it, but also in his sorrowing for it, his appropriate sorrowing for the world. In Matthew 23 which is where I'm going to turn now, Matthew 23, I think we see a, a clue as to how Christ sorrowed appropriately. Matthew 23, verse 37 to 39. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the title of this section in most Bibles is Jesus laments or sorrows over Jerusalem. So this thing that we deal with now, sorrow, this thing that at some point will pass away, we can see that Jesus did it appropriately in his time. So we should be aware of what's going on in the world and we should sorrow for those in it, not as Paul says of death, as those who have no hope, but sorrow instead as Christ did in love for those that are in the world. So as man, Christ was invested in the state of the world and he sorrowed at it. But as God, he looked beyond to a time when those he sorrowed for would repent and turn to him for their own sake. Your house is left to you desolate, he says, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's an authoritative 
um, frustration here in this sorrow as well. It's not just sorrow as the world sorrows, where we just feel bad for it. We feel bad for it, but we also want something better for it and are looking forward to that time. And we don't just uh, accept what the world does and say, oh, we hope God accepts them. We know the world has to repent. We know we have to repent. And that is all part of appropriate sorrowing as Christ did it. So we can look at the world, we can be invested in the things going on, and we can feel bad for the people in it, knowing that you know, we have a promise of hope that some of them don't have or don't accept. But we also recognize that they need to accept it and that they're kind of digging their own grave at this point. So we, we hope that they wise up and turn to Christ, but we also understand that they have a choice to make or they will have a choice to make at some time in the future. And that choice is ultimately on them. So yes, look around at the world you live in. Be aware of the things going on. Discern the time that you're living in. And feel sorrow for the people that are living in it that don't have hope. But don't sorrow as if you have no hope. That's different. You know that they have hope as well in that they have a chance to accept God. And it's just up to them if they will or not when they're made aware of that choice. So let's move on to the third one then. Crying tears. Should a true Christian cry? Now, I know this one almost sounds ridiculous because crying is part of people's lives. Everybody cries at some point. So in your mind, you're probably thinking, well, of course Christians cry. We're, I mean, we're allowed. No one says we're, we're not supposed to. But we might ask ourselves, on the other hand, shouldn't our hope be so strong that anything that goes on just runs off of us like water? Or why should things cause us emotional discomfort if we understand clearly that all of this is temporary? Does that mean that our vision isn't clear enough? You know, if we spend a lot of time crying, um, and this kind of is connected to sorrow as well, but if we spend a lot of our time in that outward expression of emotion, isn't that really just showing kind of a weakness? And isn't showing weakness wrong when we're supposed to be Christians showing the light of God to the world? And we're showing weakness instead. In Ephesians 6 verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Well, aren't we supposed to show that strength to the world? Isn't that kind of how we live a life pointing to Christ? That we show what a life redeemed from him looks like? Or in Nehemiah 8 verse 10, it says, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, aren't we supposed to show that joy to the world? Obviously, that verse is to people coming back from Babylon after the exile. But is that same joy not our strength today? I think it is. And so I think for all of these reasons, it's possible that a Christian might ask themselves, is it wrong that I'm crying? Is it wrong that I'm expressing all of this sorrow? Yes, we've already talked about having sorrow is fine, but is expression of sorrow or overexpression of sorrow, is that wrong? Or is there a way to do it appropriately? Now, some of you might know where I'm going with this. I've been going to examples of Christ and how he dealt with these current former things. And I'm going to do the same thing with this. In John 11, verse 35, it is the shortest verse in the Bible, very well known by people. And all it says is, Jesus wept. Jesus wept, so short, but so incredibly powerful. And now we know from this story that Jesus is weeping at the death of his friend Lazarus, and he's surrounded by all of these people that are continuing to doubt him, and he just takes a moment to grieve. Maybe he's grieving outwardly for the death of his friend. Maybe he's grieving outwardly for the doubters that are surrounding him, uh, including his friend Martha, who basically accused him of being party to his death because he wasn't there at the time that Lazarus died. So she's showing a measure of faith, saying you could have healed him if you were here, but also a measure of doubt, saying, why weren't you here? Why weren't you present with us? And uh, I think all of this weighed on him. So different commentaries will say different things about exactly what Christ was weeping at here, but maybe it was all of it. But at the bottom line is, he wept. He had an outward show of emotion for the pain that he was dealing with in this situation. And this is incredible. This is the savior of all of mankind, the God of the universe, weeping at something so human and so temporary. You know, he knew he was about to raise Lazarus, but he wept anyways. He knew that death was not the end of all things, and he still wept. 
And he knew that he was going to see him again. Even if he didn't resurrect him right now, he knew that someday death would be wiped away. Tears would be wiped away. Pain would be wiped away. Sorrow wiped away. And still, Jesus in this moment chose to weep. I saw that recently on a couple of different social media platforms, different different pictures pointing this out. And to me, it was just so humbling and so incredible because this is the most powerful being in the universe, the one that created all of this, interacting with it on such a temporal plane and still choosing to weep because he felt that emotion. He felt that pain and he saw nothing wrong with that outward show of how he was feeling. When we say that Christ humbled himself and took on the form of a man, I think this shows it more than almost anywhere else in the Bible, other than perhaps his crucifixion and death. But this moment where he's he's weeping for his friend, I think this shows the humanity that Christ took on when he became a man. And I think it also shows us or should show us some insight into Christ as God, because he was fully man and fully God at the exact same time. And he took on both of those roles perfectly. So as a man, Jesus internalized the cares of those around him. He had feelings and emotions, and he had no qualms about expressing himself emotionally. But as God, Jesus knew that tears would pass away at some point and that they wouldn't last. But he didn't need to pretend that there was nothing that could or should presently cause tears. There are things to cry about. There are things to sorrow about. There are things that hurt us Death is real. Just because these things will be former someday doesn't mean they're former now and we have to act like they're former now. And Christ knew that, exemplified it, and then showed us that it's all right to cry. And I think that's a that's a great thing. In Romans 12, 15, we're actually even commanded to cry. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. So even though, like it says, weeping will be a thing of the past in that future coming kingdom of God, it's not a thing of the past right now, and it's not wrong. God created us with the ability to show emotion, and there's nothing wrong with that right now. Yes, we look forward to that time when it's gone, but we don't need to pretend that that time has already happened. All right, so what about the last one? The fourth current former thing, pain. Should anything hurt us? And I know this also sounds a little bit ridiculous, but I think you'll see as we go into it a little bit more, just like crying or tears, there is some legitimacy to asking this question. I listened to an online preacher one time that said, the dead don't feel pain. If you're dead in Christ, then nothing can hurt you. And of course, this sounds ridiculous because we know we feel pain. We can think back to a time that we've hurt, whether that's emotionally or physically. We know that. It happens to us. But we also might want to consider the fact that The disciples rejoiced at being beaten, and some early church fathers rejoiced at the thought of being martyred for Christ. We have their letters preserved that show them essentially acting as if they had just won the lottery because they were about to be martyred in the name of Christ. So does this mean that pain meant nothing to them? Does our vision of what's coming, our living in the spirit, mean that our actual flesh is of no consequence? Well, if we look to Christ again, I think we'll see that Jesus also felt pain. We already went through some of the mental and emotional pain he went through in anticipation of the crucifixion, but let's also remember the heartbreak that he must have felt at his disciples falling asleep on him while he was trying to pray in the garden, or even at being betrayed by one of his own. He knew it had to happen. He knew he had to be betrayed. He knew he was going to, but this was still a man that spent three and a half years with Christ, getting to know him. I don't think Christ treated him poorly, and for someone that you've given everything to, to turn around and betray you, no matter if you know it has to happen or not, has to kind of hurt on some level. And I think we forget about this because we kind of have this selective reading of Christ where we only consider him to be man in some parts and God in other parts when he's fully man and fully God in every account we read about him in the Gospels. So I think this betrayal would have been heartbreaking to him. And that's not even to mention the physical pain and discomfort that he experienced on the cross from thirst to disorientation when they put a bag over his head and beat him to humiliation, to scourging, to the pain of the nails themselves, to lack of air that hanging on the cross would cause. Jesus Christ felt an inordinate amount of pain. In Isaiah 53 verse 11 
Uh, I'm going to read from the ESV. Actually, I'll start in in, uh, verse 10. It says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So his suffering was for our sake, to look on as an example so that we can bear our own suffering when it comes to us. Christ paid the price with his death, obviously. But we can see just how high that price was by witnessing and understanding the suffering that he went through. So we see the extreme nature of the effects of sin as it leads us to death. And that knowledge is a part of why we have the strength to remain faithful because of what he did for us. So this pain was necessary. Yes, he felt it. He felt every second of it. And that is a horrible thing to meditate on, but it's also a strengthening thing to meditate on when we realize he suffered more than we probably ever will in our lives. Now, this isn't to say that none of us are called to be martyrs like the apostles were or like Christ was himself, but it's just to show that Christ wasn't unwilling to go through all of this first. So we shouldn't be unwilling to follow after him. So as man, Christ did not enjoy pain. He absolutely felt every second of it. But as God, he knew that life would consist of pain, but he also knew it had a purpose and he took it anyways for our sake so that we can see his example and bear our own pain and suffering well, not just pretend it doesn't exist because it won't for us as spirit beings. Yes, maybe there will come a time when pain does not exist at all, but that time is not right now and we don't have to act like things don't hurt. Christ knew that they hurt, but I think Christ had in mind, as we also should, the concept found in Romans 8.18, where it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. So that's how we deal with pain. We know that it exists. We don't try and pretend that just because we're Christians, we can't feel pain. And we're even allowed to express the fact that we feel pain. But again, we can't feel pain as if there is no hope. We have to remember that this pain is for something, that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the things to come. And that vision should be very, very clear to us. So we have pain different than the world has pain. We have pain in such a way that we can relate to the world, but not in such a way that it causes us to lose heart. If you would, turn with me to one final scripture as we conclude this study today in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. I think this is a really important verse to understanding exactly what we're talking about here today, where we are supposed to be living in this world right now as human beings, but also living for the next world as if we are becoming members of God's kingdom and his family. And it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is so important, from glory to to glory. We spend so much time speaking and preaching against Gnosticism, where they either hated the body and loved the spirit, or loved the body and hated the spirit, or overindulged the body and hated the spirit. But let's not become Gnostic ourselves, denying our humanhood or denying our spiritual life. We are going from mortal life into eternal life and should be transitioning our way from human to spirit. But it doesn't mean the human side is all evil. It says here that we're going from glory to glory. Yes, a better glory, something we should desire, but we don't get there by hating the parts of us that are still us. That's a standard that no one can ever live up to, and it'll just lead ultimately to disappointment. And I don't think anybody wants that. There are things in this life that I'm looking forward to having pass away. I'm looking forward to putting on immortality and I want to continue to become more and more ready for that time when death, sorrow, crying, pain are things of the past. They're officially former things rather than current former things. But I don't want to pretend as if all of those things are gone right now, living in this kind of false reality. 
Christ showed us a perfect example as he was both fully man and fully God, how we should reconcile some of these juxtaposing ideas of the Christian walk, not denying our humanhood, but doing our best to become more and more ready to embrace our future in the spirit. So until that change comes, let's all try and follow that perfect example. I hope this was a beneficial study for you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I really appreciate everybody who took the time to listen and to study along with me. It really does mean the world. If you would like to support Truth Be Told in other ways besides just listening, which is already a huge support to me, um, you can interact with any of my content, follow me on any social media platform, uh, leave ratings, comments on any of the streaming services. I really, really do appreciate that. That helps this get to more people, and it just means a lot to see people uh, benefiting from this content. So thank you once again for listening and for participating in the study with me. Until next time, keep on reading your Bibles, keep on thinking critically about them, and keep on applying the truths that we learn here to your lives. Have a great day, everybody.